，有的是这么想。مساكم الله بخير ويعطيكم العافية ونشكر مؤتمر تمكين على هذه الاستضافة ويعني كلمة بسيطة بس بقولها عن المؤتمر أنا كل ما أحضر هالمؤتمر أو نرعى يزيدني شغف حق سنة الجاية وأتمنى أن كل سنة نضل على هذا المستوى وهذا النجاح هذا هو الشيء اللي يطور الكويت ويخلينا نشتغل أكثر. Thank you. شكرا. Thank you Patrick. Thank you for your great presentation. Thank you. I just want to add a quick brief about our life in Kuwait with Google. Mm -hmm. If we want to drive to somewhere, we use Google. If we want to cook something, uh, we Google it. <laughs> if we want to search about someone or, or any, uh, anything we're looking for, we just Google it. Um, I've heard a lot about you. I've, I've, I've been reading about you, and uh, I've been seeing some videos until yesterday night about you. So we'll start just a quick discussion. Yes. And then we'll ask... Um, questions. The visitors for questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll start with the first question, which is, you said, if you feel very comfortable in, in your job, you have to fire yourself. Yeah, right? I said that. Can, you, can we know why? So I said that I, I was interviewed by a journalist in, who was doing a piece, and he was asking me about development. How do you develop as a leader? And I'm going to make a really long story super short. So you only have one life, unless you believe in reincarnation, but I don't believe in reincarnation. So let's park reincarnation for a sec. We only have one life. And you, if you want to be a leader, you need to constantly learn and grow. And if you're going to constantly learn and grow, as I said a minute ago, you need to be on this path of learning so that you can, not because you want to be better and smarter, because you can serve your team better. And to serve your team better, I mean, when in the jobs I've had, I've had tens of thousands of employees. You're there to make sure that they, each and every one of them has a great opportunity to develop and learn and then deliver on the values of their business. So if you're not learning, you're not serving your employees. If you're not learning, you're not progressing in your development. So you're not actually going to the next step. So for me, it's always a feeling of, if you, it's like when you learn the piano, you know, you get stuck on some piece and you keep on practicing and practicing, and then you get it, and then it's too easy. Now you kind of like your mind wanders when you play. Then you know that you've stopped learning. It's time to go to the next step. So firing yourself is really the image of, hey, catch yourself. Nobody else is going to do it. Everybody is going to be very happy that you... In fact, some bosses are happy that you stay in your place because you're so good at what you do. But now you're bored. It's time for you to fire yourself and you look for the next opportunity. Okay. I'll just ask about the environment in Google. And everyone knows that there is a great environment, a great gyms, spas. Uh, you can bring your dog into Google. Yes. So I just want to hear about the environment and why you decided to, to shift this place into a, a different environment. And everyone is now is, is trying to be Google. Copy it. Yeah. Um, it's really driven by the founders. Larry and Sergey, when they started Google, uh, they were in a garage, they had no money, uh, but they, they cared for the employees. Um, I was discussing a bit earlier today, when th the reason why we have dogs is because one of their employees, in the very early days of Google, he and his partner, she had to go back to Germany, or Germany for six months to get a visa to come back to the US. And so here we are, he walks in on Monday morning, Geske has gone to Germany and he has two big dogs. And so he walks into the office with the two big dogs and everybody's like, what's up with the dogs? And his answer is, well, we have no money, we're a startup and I have two dogs and my wife is gone. So here are the dogs and everybody was 
okay. So there was the policy for having dogs at Google. And the same thing for, again, I was explaining earlier today, everybody kind of jumps on the massage therapists and they say, and, and the buses, right? So the massage therapists, Larry and Sergey are coders. They're computer scientists. So if you spend your life coding, two months of coding is one thing, but if you're going to code for 20 years, and you're going to be at your desk with your hands like this on a computer screen, massage is not a luxury anymore. Massage is actually an important part of your healthcare benefits so that at 30 and 40, you're not you know, yeah. carpal tunnel and everything else. So every bit of what is Google, yes, we do have the slides. And yes, we have the big balloons. And yes, there's a climbing wall in my office. Yes, that's true. We have all that. <laughs> but even the climbing wall, I mean, we put, every building has something special that's available to all Googlers. And we happen to have thousands of people, of which hundreds are they're rock climbers because we're right next to the Yosemite National Park. And so these people, they're coding. Now they've done four hours of coding. They're stuck on a math problem of some sort. And they just want to chill for an hour. They show up at our building. You see them hanging off the roof. <laughs> and half an hour later, they're back at work. This is like completely not. And it costs nothing, right? People kind of make a big drag about it. It costs nothing. Our buses, we have a great bus service at Google. We're one of the largest bus companies in the north of California. Oh. When you take a Google bus, you hop in on the morning, you instantly have internet access. So now you can do all your emails before you're even in the, into the office. And for us at the office, I don't need parking. Yeah. So I save all the capital that would be required to have all of these cars show up. So in what looks like madness is in fact a combination of caring for employees and great business sense. And it pays off. And you see it today. Everybody is, as you said, copy it because it makes sense. Perfect. I'll just move to the financial aspect. Um, you said today that Google started their Google Capital, and they started their Venture Capital. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting on the, on the board of Google and the board of Twitter, and, and you've been the C CFO for, for, for Google. My question is, how do you choose or pick a company or, or, or a small business or entrepreneurs and acquire them, and what are the aspects or, or, or the benefits that you're looking for in any company, and how many companies do you buy per, per month? So we Just buy, so. I mean, when I was there, we bought a lot of companies. We bought a lot of com companies, we invested a lot, and our, <laughs> our philosophy, let me separate two things. One is, most of the companies we purchased were talent acquisitions. Okay. So we would, sometimes technology too, um, but a lot of times what we would find is we would have a specific focus on, let's say, Chrome or, or Google Maps, and then we'd look for something that we, so we have an agenda for the year and we're going to deliver on this agenda, and, but there's some aspect of it that has a lot of technical knowledge and we can build it in-house, but then at the same time, we would scan the world to see, hey, is there somebody who's figured out this mousetrap? And if somebody's figured out this mousetrap, we'd go and look at these companies, and then we'd offer them to come to Google to help us solve this big problem. So often we would have this benefit of bringing people on. And that, by the way, that's how Android started. Android was an acquisition of five people. Five? Five people. Andy Rubin and his four colleagues. That's it. That was Android. And, but we had this issue, we saw the world changing. So here's, the, here's the, the pitch, right? Remember, I said a bit earlier, if you're not serving a billion people, we're not spending our time on this. So now, the issue was this. This is the uh, early, mid-2000. Every phone company has its own operating system. Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, the operating system is the same. Android didn't exist. The only one that was on its own was Apple. So now you have all these different phone companies, all with different operating systems. 
And what you know is people are going to use more and more their phones. But to get any phone to work with Google or any browser was a complete disaster because you had to get every single phone company to get your stuff to work. And so the ecosystem was not going to launch unless there was a, a common operating system. So we took the bet, we bought that small company, and the rest is history. Okay, my, my second question is, how do you choose between the companies? I think millions of billions of companies are approaching you guys. Or you guys approach um, entrepreneurs or seeds A, B, C. Yeah. For those, so how do I you mean, choose? the venture capital arm of Google is just like a tier one venture capital. They look, it has a big focus on technology, and it looks for promising young talent that want to change the world. All these criteria that I showed you a bit earlier, it's a big template of how you have a technology that wants to change the world. Is there a benefit for a billion people? Um, do you have a mousetrap that's different? Do you have a team that actually can act, deliver on it? And if you have all these ingredients, and then, you know, can we see kind of good partnerships in the future? And then the Google Venture team does its job. And they're pretty good at it. Perfect. Okay. What about failure? Failure is everywhere at Google. And Absolutely everywhere. When is the best time to kill the idea or to kill the business? And, and this, this is like... Here's the issue. You see Google from the outside, and so you think, well, of course it's perfect. Google has a ton of failures all the time because we try a lot of things. I mean, remember Google Glass? Yeah. Right? And, and so we, had, we have a lot of experiments at Google all the time. We're lucky because in software, you can do a lot of experimentation before you launch. So you can see failure before you, the user, sees failure. So that's a big advantage of a software business. Um, but for us, I mean, as a CFO, what we did is, for every group that wanted to try something that needed a minimum amount of capital, we basically tracked them like a venture capitalist. So we'd say, okay, you want to try this thing? Fine. Here you go. And, and it always passes the same test. Do you think we're going to have a billion users? Like, we would not do, and I'm not being critical here, we would not do, like, a ninja fruit something. You'd never see that at Google, right? Somebody's going to make it. And, but people would come to see me with their business cases, and they'd say, so I'd say, how many users are you going to have in the next five years? And they'd say, well, you know, 150 million users. I'm like, well, end of conversation. And like everywhere else in the world, right? People always say, what, 150 million users? Because by definition, you're not changing the world. And so what we'd have is a gating process where every 90 days, just like a venture capitalist, we'd look at our portfolio and we'd decide, is it working or not? And if it's not working, then we'd ask them to go back to the drawing board. And sometimes we'd say, look, it's not working. And by the way, the Googlers know it. So when Google employees work in a project that's failing, there's 10 other projects that can go next door. So you almost have the market at work there where people already kind of, you lose one person, and, and then we say, okay, so that's failed. How do we redeploy the resources in the best way in the company? And that's what we did. And people are happy. They're like, well, oh, that was a good try. You have a big party. You say, well, that didn't work, but it was all right. And then you go on to the next thing. Okay. One more last question, and then we'll open the questions for... Um, you always say you like to hire and work with women, and you always support women. Yes, Can absolutely. You know why? I, I mean, it's half the population. <laughs> it's half the population. I mean, it's that simple. And, and on some demand... Here's what I've learned. I've learned that when you have a team and you only have 20% of women, then the women are more quiet. There's an imbalance in the dialogue. And the minute that you have 50% women in a team, then the fighting really starts. 
I have 80% my company. <laughs> there you go. So you know you're part in the food chain then. And, and I think it's super important that everybody... There's a lot of, it's interesting because there's a lot of research on this. If you have diversity of, of in, in your teams, it takes a little bit longer to get the answer, but the answer is always better. And that's why I always look for diversity, and I always encourage. And so we, had, we started all these diversity projects at Google for that reason. We were seeing we were losing the war. Like, we couldn't. And so we said, no, 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 this is wrong. We have to. And that's why we went public. We went public to make a statement that says, look, this is wrong. We have to do things differently. And we put all our stats in the public domain. And I'm super proud of the work that we've done. There's still a lot of work to do. But absolutely, this is, this is I always say, you know, I don't work on the answers of yesterday to the problems of the day before yesterday. We already know this answer, right? We should have, you know, absolute, you know, equality on not only the representation, but then equality on pay, of course, which I think all, I know Kuwait has as well. So two thumbs up on Kuwait on that one. Thank you. Okay. First question from Maryam. What does success look like for you? And what do you feel like doing to be more successful? There's two dimensions to this. There's my personal dimension, and then there is my obligation dimensions. For myself, I have this really simple puzzle. I think everybody should have a life of impact and have the, have the, the opportunity to contemplate beauty. I think beauty matters in the world. It's an incredible gift to be able to have beauty around us. And I think that a life of impact is incredibly important. A life of impact basically means that you can be fulfilled yourself in your, your personal aspirations to your own means. And it means to me, which is the second piece is, I think it's super important, and I've always been like this, I think that it's important that when we're finished, we leave to our children and our grandchildren a better world than we got. And that's an obligation we each of us have. So that's the basically what I'm carrying with myself. Okay. Is it true that a software engineer in Google gets paid three million per year? How much? Three million dollars. Wow. I don't think so. <laughs> if you do the math of the number of employees and our salaries, I don't think that math works. <laughs> what do you envision and then and what do you envision is the future in tech startups in the next 10 years or not? The future of startup for the next yeah. 10 years in tech? I think there's going to be more. I think it's going to be a frenzy because of what I've talked about. I think machine learning and artificial intelligence and what we've seen in the last 10 years is nothing to compare to what's coming in the next 10 years. I, there's going to be so much opportunity. And the, by the way, people who tell you that you know, there's no money in the world, that's wrong. The world is awash with cash. The question is, do you have a good idea, and is it well presented, and is it well packaged, and are you organized for it? If you are, there's no limit on capital. Okay. How will e-commerce affect the future of business? Pardon me? How will e-commerce affect the future of business? Um, I think that th there's a broader question in this question, so allow me to kind of tackle it. I think that we as a society have to come to recognize, there's a lot of debate about it, but I think we have to prepare ourselves for a world in which there's going to be a lot more automation. And we can either ignore it, or we can look at it right in the, in the eyes and then ask ourselves the questions, what do we do about it? So. If you think of, I'll take the United States as an example, where I live today, right? The, some of the biggest sources of jobs and employment are going to be in transportation, driving trucks, um, retail, which is Walmart and all these other ones, and uh, nurses in hospitals. 
And what we know is, certainly for the first two and even on the third one, these profound changes that are occurring, right, most of the jobs is going to disappear. In a few years, nobody's going to drive a truck. Certainly not on the interstate, which is a bulk of what's going on in the U.S. And so, the question that we have as a society to answer to is, and this is where the imagination is important, is what are the new jobs that we need to create in order to actually fulfill all these? And we have so much opportunity, but we need to retrain people and make sure that we have a just society in this transition so that if you were a truck driver and you're now 56 years old and you're still healthy and can work, but you're never going to learn computer science, we need some social justice for these people. We need a transition that enables society to live at peace during this transition. And so I actually think, I'm convinced that the changes are going to be profound, and I think that they're going to be a real challenge and a real leadership issue for us to actually think through these issues. And, but we can see it coming, so we have no excuse not to do something about it. Okay. Can you re recommend five books? that we should read? Oh, five books. That's a long list. I've been reading, by the way, one of the things I've been doing in this sabbatical, I've basically been reading. I have, I've ne had no time to read for 25 years, and now I've had time to read. So I've been reading a lot. Um, why don't I think about it and give to the organizers my list after so you can post it? There's like, a, I've been reading a ton, but like I've been reading on quantum mechanics. I don't think you guys want to read on quantum mechanics. <laughs> so, uh, woohoo, go for quantum, right? So I'll give you the list of the books that I've been reading and that I've, I've really, really enjoyed. If, if you haven't read, I think let's go top of mind. Um, Sapiens, which is a super good book, but then I'll, I'll, I'll give you my list and then you can sort it out afterwards. There are great books out there today. Okay, Jamal, I'll give you the list of books that I've been reading. Now what? How, how far developed is AI in Google? And what, what's coding. cooking in the black box? Okay. How far is AI at Google? It's, well, it's interesting because at Google, AI is nascent because it's nascent for everybody. But Google is committed to it. And if you've seen, there's a famous uh, game in South Korea. I think it's called Go. And, and you may remember that IBM had this computer that was supposed to beat somebody on Jeopardy, which is a game show in the U.S. And it took a number of years, but the computer finally beat a Jeopardy and became Watson is its name of the computer. And then the next step was to actually beat Go, which is a, com a game in Korea that has billions of permutations and combinations. And they thought that it would take between 10 and 15 years to beat Go. This year is the first time that they tried it at Google. It won immediately. Oh. So, Google is on it. <laughs> <laughs> and, but there's space for everybody. Okay. I couldn't read this, but, your... to, but I think they're asking about the two years of having uh, your vacation. Changed me, yes. How the two years changed? It changed me profoundly. Here's, Here's the trick. I remember I told you, you know, the minute that you start feeling like you're flat, you should fire yourself. This is a bit what happened to me. My next five years at Google was going to be the same as the last three years. I had a really good job, right? Well-paying job. I knew what I was doing, but I was going to do the same thing. And it happens that at 53 years old, my children had just left the house because they're all in university or working, so there's nobody home. We only have a cactus, so there's nothing to water or plant. There's no animals. And because I'm going to work... In the old days, when my, my parents, my grandparents, people died young. They died at 65, 67. People were, had hard lives and they died young, and the medicine wasn't there with any help and a bit of luck, I'll probably live to be 90. Now, if you're going to live to be 90, 
Think of it, if you're 25 in this audience, and let's make a round number, you're going to live to 100. In your case, you're going to live to 100. People think of their careers as like, what am I going to do for 25 years, then I'm going to retire, I'm going to buy myself a sailboat, and I'm going to play golf, or whatever they do. You have 75 years of good, active life ahead of you. So now if you think like this, I've just finished 30 years of work, but I'm still in great shape. So what I've learned is taking two years off at 50, when you can climb Kilimanjaro and can climb, go to Antarctica and cross the U.S. by mountain bike, I won't be able to do that when I'm 85 or 90, but I can do it now. And now I'm completely refreshed. I've read my 50 books. And now I'm ready to tackle another 25 years. And I'm coming in with a vengeance. I'm going to be a force to reckon with. And so I think that you have to be smart about your career. Remember serendipity? Here's a moment where I can take a break. I just jumped in it. Best decision. And my wife and I have had this wonderful time of reconnecting after working each of us so hard for so many years. Best decision after marrying her. <laughs> Best decision <laughs> I've ever made. <laughs> One more last question. Mr. Hale. <laughs> I'm okay. Um, I'm on your Does sport. Google think about to make the internet free for, the, for all the world? Google would love that. In, in short, that's why we have projects like Loon, that's why we have projects like Fiber, Access. I mean, there's always an economic cost, but at the end of the day, we want everybody in the world. The minute you have access to internet, the whole world is on your fingertips. You democratize knowledge, you democratize access to information, you give everybody a chance. That is such a noble cause, and that's why Google stands for that. Okay, let's end this the session with the last question from me. Yes. What do you think about Kuwait and and how do you see it? I have been in your beautiful country for only a few days. I have been so impressed by the energy. I've been so impressed by the youth. I've been, even today, I took the time and was invited to go to the parliament and seeing the politicians. This place wants to make things happen. This place has the wind in its back. I think you're on to great things. Please keep it up. And I think, I can't wait to see your progress over the coming years. I'm incredibly optimistic for you. So keep it up, Kuwait. I look forward to seeing your progress. Do you want to answer this question? <laughs> How much was your salary and your yearly bonus at, at Google? Well, that's the question. It's actually public information, if you want to know. Yeah, it listed companies, much of the end. I was paid $22 million a year. And I can tell you, my wife and I, because it's, like, here's transparency, right? Why should you be afraid of, so I was paid $22 million a year. And my wife and I have been basically working on giving most of this money away to community. <laughs>